Mr. President, if I could just start with a very simple question. Yep, any question you like. How are you? Okay. Are you sure that that is a simple question? <laughs> I think it's one of the difficulties. I don't know. I think I'm like Ukraine, so it's each tough situation and big tragedy, but we are strong. With a strong spirit, ready to fight for us, just for our families, for, 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 for people, for country, for, 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 for everything what belongs especially to us. It's been six months. Six months of unadulterated hell for Ukraine. Whether you're the survivors in Kiev, the capital that staved off an invasion, even blowing up its own bridges to stop the Russian tanks. People trying to pretend things are normal, willing them to be so, despite being surrounded by reminders it's anything but. Or if you're the scarred in towns like Bucha and Irpin, these were the front lines caught in the crossfire. Once idyllic places to raise young families, now Bucha will always be synonymous with war crimes, torture, rape, execution and mass graves. Then there are the scared, towns like Mykolaiv, terrorised and terrified of becoming the next butcher. The survivors, the scarred and the scared, weighing on one man more than most. I think the world has been struck by the resilience of the Ukrainian people. And I, I would, if you could, take me back to that day, the 24th of... February, those those first hours of the invasion. An another life. Another lifetime ago. Take me back to those first moments, how you piece them together, how you remember them. Well, frankly speaking, I don't really remember that much the day of the 24th of, of February. And uh, on that day, the Russia has changed uh, the lives uh, of all the Ukrainians and uh, of the life in the territory of Ukraine. And uh, later on, we realized that it wasn't only for Ukraine, but for the rest of the world. And before, on, uh, before that day, I was a president of my country, living with my own family. And after that, I've become a president of the country at war, of the nation at war. And I was there with my, uh, with my uh, nation, and then there was family. Now family is not with me. I mean, so, sometimes I can see them, but sometimes. And so, Dr. Uh, I mean, earlier, I usually had a question from my younger uh, child, a boy, and he would call and ask me, what time are you planning to get back home and now the questions are all all over the phone and he might just ask me okay when will we have a chance to to see one another and on your family i mean i wonder how close did russian troops come to finding you and your family and how does that feel to know that a russian strike force is hunting to capture or kill your children how does that feel as a father well, um, during the times of this attempted occupation of the Kiev uh, and uh, the occupation of uh, the Kiev region, uh, there were missiles hitting uh, the Kiev. And at that time, every father would be taking care or thinking of his own children, of his own family. Now, in my case, there was this but, because it was my wife who had to take care of, of, uh, of the children, and I had to go uh, into this uh, place, because I would was the, and I am the president. I am. <laughs> <laughs> At this point. <laughs> and I am the president of uh, this uh, country, so I had to think of 
more other issues. No, but it's just, yeah, that's At the same time, I was uh, feeling worried, of course, because uh, the world was in place and uh, it continues now. And of course, uh, the, for, the, for the children, it was they were attracting more of an attention. Besides, they were being the targets. They had uh, some security details, and uh, all, uh, of course, that had an, an impact. And uh, I would say that they grew older, um, mature, so to say, like young children, but becoming older in terms of their experience. Robbed a bit of their childhood, perhaps. Do you, how do you see this ending? And this is another very big question, but how do you see this ending? How long could this war last? Now that is a question that I can be answering for a long with period all, of time. Yes, with all the details, I mean that. It depends on, on many things. Mm. Um, it all depends on how strong we are on the battlefield. And that requires a joint support uh, from the whole world. And we are also be strong when Russians will be weak, meaning that we, when we will receive the support in terms of the weapons and all other types of supports for us, when when the, we will not have uh, the situation when R Russian forces ha are having 10 or 20 times more of the personnel or the weaponry, when there will be sanctions uh, imposed against the Russian Federation, when there will be further support uh, and financial support uh, to Ukraine, when Russia would feel isolated, when there would be no visas for the Russian citizens, when the leaders of the foreign countries would not be meeting with uh, the Russian leadership, when Russia would feel as if they're left alone. Because uh, 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 there's uh, something that the Russian leadership is afraid. So uh, uh, when it will have all these strengths, then it would allow us to finish the war, to have this war uh, finished in a shorter period of time. And uh, uh, I would also like to say that when Russians would be on retreat, it is in that case that we would, we would be able to start negotiations with them and not just to respond to whatever ultimatums they might have for us. As far back as April, you were worried about fatigue. How troubled are you now, six months into this war? How troubled are you that the world's attention is waning? Well, I, I do feel very worried, and this is a challenge. This fatigue issue is, is a challenge, because every country has its own internal issues, internal matters to settle. You take COVID, you take the energy crisis, uh, you take the seaports of uh, Ukraine being blocked in the Black Sea, resulting in a food crisis uh, in some of the countries of the world. Now, Russia is attempting to switch the attention of the many countries in the world to some other issues uh, to some other challenges and that's the part of uh, Russia's hybrid uh, tactics uh, by switching to the other problems and I mean if the country is located far away from Ukraine as uh, in the case of New Zealand we do grateful for the support they are providing but still I mean they are located far far away so they might think that it's it's a far away issue but still uh, we're not willing to have this war spreading on other territories uh, as this could easily happen. And that is why it's important that we receive the support. It's important to uh, to end this here and now because uh, uh, the war would be spreading like a cancer. And we know this President Putin and we know this President of a long table, so to say, and his intentions as to that matter. The President's words are clear. New Zealand has a role to play in stemming the spread of Russia's influence and intentions. New Zealand's offered support, but is it enough? To help answer that question, I would meet New Zealanders on the ground in Ukraine, fighters and aid workers, as well as Ukrainians desperately seeking to come to Aotearoa and escape the atrocities of Putin's unconscionable invasion. World, help us. That is exactly what we need.
she's a New Zealander, but Jenny Beasley isn't afraid to die for Ukraine. Company chief medic for the number one international company, a Ukrainian armed forces unit with soldiers from all over the world. World help us. That is exactly what we need. Beasley trained as a fighter pilot with the British Royal Air Force and has been working as a doctor for two decades. She goes everywhere with me, hey? Yeah, yep. that's stunning. Keeps me safe. And she'll take all the help she can get. Life's taken a dramatic turn. What made me come here, I was sitting in my, you know, my yacht somewhere in the South Pacific, having a great time, loving life. It's a very privileged life, really. Um, but it's hard to walk past what's happening here. Just the shock. You know, even when you, t I mean, you must have noticed when you talk to people, um, just everyday people, Ukrainians uh, are really shocked that this ever happened. You know, the reasons you come here are all completely eclipsed by the reasons that make you stay, you know. Um, which for me, obviously, is that brotherhood with, with my colleagues, my comrades in arms um, and my unit. Um, and just what you experience here and you realise that, that there's so much need here, really. You have lost some of these brothers in arms mm. as well, the people that keep yeah. you here. Yeah, we, we've, lost, um, we've lost five guys from our unit. And it was really tough because we, we're not a huge unit and to lose those five guys was um, really difficult for people. She's philosophical about her own fate. I've obviously thought about death a lot and rationalised, you know, how I feel about sort of putting my life on the line and because um, a very real chance that, that, you know, I'll die or one of the other guys will die. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really, for myself, I'm very comfortable with that. I've had a, you know, pretty, pretty full and crazy and very enjoyable and privileged life already. And, um, I guess it makes me a little more relaxed with the possibility that it might all end um, very soon. But it's just luck, really. You know, with artillery, it's either going to hit you or it isn't. What can you do? What Jenny and her friends on the front line do fear is complacency. We are really afraid that people are going to forget that there are people dying here in Ukraine and uh, civilians dying here in Ukraine every day as well. We, we really need, we need the world to step up even more than they've stepped up. Um, need New Zealand to step up particularly. Um, I think, you know, my, you know, a lot of my colleagues will say, oh, you know, you're one of the five eyes and it, we're not seen as an insignificant country out here, you know, particularly not amongst the military. Hey, how are you? Yeah, not bad. How are you? I'm very Through a well. network of former special forces and military in Ukraine, we tracked down another Kiwi soldier we only know as Tolkien. He's fighting somewhere on the Eastern Front. I'm here in Ukraine helping um, Ukraine maintain its independence and, yeah, push back Russia. Keen for the combat experience New Zealand's military wasn't able to give him, the adrenaline rush of being in contact with the enemy. Definitely an opportunity for that. Um, I think many war veterans anyway of finding a new um, place of uh, combat in this war anyway. Um, good to put our skills to the test and the uh, Inter Defence Force training is um, serving us well, I think. Both him and Jenny are only speaking out to try to encourage New Zealand to do more. Humanitarian aid is important, but um, it's important to support the war itself as well with uh, munitions and whatever they um, can provide. And how great is the need there on the front line for that additional support from New Zealand? Yeah, very important. Um, it's, it's very visible when this money is filtering through from the west and you're seeing the good results of that and, and the lives being saved and you know you see a lot of um, times when it doesn't come through and a lot of people are, are dying because of this so you know the faster this conflict can can be resolved um, the better it is and the more Ukrainian lives are going to be saved. Since the beginning of the full-scale invasion Ukraine has received various aid from its allies 
It ranged from portable missile launchers... Weapons, weapons, weapons. That's been the plea from the Ukrainian president from the outset of the invasion too, and the focus of its global campaign. New Zealand has only provided $7.5 million in lethal military support. What can we buy with $7.5 million New Zealand dollars? Uh, I, I can tell you, one, one, for example, uh, one artillery shell. Yes, because I'm in the audience, audience. Well, uh, one artillery shell where it could cost something like uh, 1500 US dollars. That's. 1.5 thousand US dollars. One, one shell. One artillery shell. So one, 155 millimeters shell, for yeah. example. It's about, it can be the, the market war, so the market is different, but it can be about one and a half, 1,500 US dollars. So I said that it can be about uh, 3,000, something like the 3,000 shells. 3,000 shells. Yes. So it's it's not a lot. It's not even a day of the war. It's not. It's not enough for the day, for example, for one day. But it's so, I mean, it's not, it's, it's not my, I have no questions to New Zealand. I mean that you asked how, what, what we can buy. I know what we buy, I mean that, so. Because that support, the lethal military support. Maybe they, maybe they can't, I mean, they give more, so. I mean, that, that's why the war is far from New Zealand. So, I mean, that to, to understand the deepness of this tragedy and problem, it's to, to, to be here. That's why I can invite you. That's why I want to thank you and journalists of New Zealand, because, of course, the information is quicker than people. So, I mean, that you can give people right messages. Right messages for me is true messages. The $7.5 million that we committed in lethal military support, that was back in April. We haven't committed a cent more to lethal military support since then. Should we? Well, of course, we count on the support uh, that could be provided from any country. And uh, I've uh, given you an example uh, for the pricing of a worn artillery shell, and, uh, and the war is still in progress. And besides, we're using five to six times uh, a smaller number of artillery shells if compared with the Russians, because the Russians have uh, their own enormous amount of uh, uh, supplies. We have sent um, military personnel as well who are helping with training and intelligence support for Ukraine. Our elite SAS Special Forces soldiers, they are some of the best in the world. Could they help in any capacity inside or outside Ukraine? Well, on the territory of the Baltic countries, your personnel, your experienced personnel, it didn't engage in the training for our men and women, and hopefully this training mission would continue. These are our special forces soldiers. Are they helping with training? Yes. We have New Zealand SAS soldiers supporting the war in Ukraine. I have information from our soldier that you have these uh, high level people, I mean that, and, and they already gave help and training missions on the territory of uh, Baltic countries to our people. Right. Can you tell me any more about their operations, how many there are or where they're based exactly? Um, it, it was about, I think, 20 people. I think 20, it was about 20 people. And are they still there? I don't know. I don't know. Well, uh, we're not spreading too much uh, of uh, details on that, but we do have uh, experts from special operation forces or some other military experts coming and training uh, our personnel uh, on the, the territory of our partner countries. They're training and conducting military operations and doing some demining. Uh, and we are, of course, we are very grateful to our partners for organizing those training missions. Because their skills are so advanced, are those the types of soldiers you would want helping Ukraine, the elite SAS soldiers, you want them? 
Well, we have a lot of training missions and our military are in close contact and um, I, I believe they have a, a very clear understanding as to how to proceed with those uh, training missions. Um, so that's a, a yes, you would like our best guys to help if, if we could give them. Well, of course, we would be very grateful to any type of support coming. After initially refusing to comment on SAS operational issues, the government then denied SAS involvement in Ukraine. And despite President Zelensky telling us he wants their involvement, the government says Ukraine hasn't asked. Kiwis on the front line just wish our government would listen to Ukraine's government, listen to its needs. It's going to take a lot more re resource than what we've got and I think, you know, nobody knows when the resource is going to dry up but everyone's fearful of that. And it's probably, you know, speaking from military context, it's probably the only thing that we're fearful of. And, you know, some countries, well, probably like my own, haven't really come to the party yet, so, yeah. She got water. <laughs> that same concern shared by other New Zealanders I'd find in Ukraine, also putting their lives at risk to help. Oh man, it's heartbreaking. The, the, the hundreds of stories that we, we get to listen to are just the smell of death everywhere. Ukraine's beauty belies its hurt travelling south from Kiev towards the front line. At first marvelling at the sunflower fields stretching forever before recognising the global sunflower oil shortage because the wars prevented their harvest. In Mykolaiv, a strategically critical town connecting the capital to the port in Odessa, residents queue for food parcels. A little help goes a long way. Okay, some water in there. Got some ravioli. Owen Pormana was a 501 deportee, a drug addict, in and out of prison. Now he's here, his life reset by helping others with theirs. Oh man, it's heartbreaking. The, the, the hundreds of stories that we we get to listen to, are, uh, it's hard to process sometimes. I mean, like the, just the smell of death everywhere. But it'll sort of be beneficial if you buy that. Owen's hooked into a network of missionaries, the Great Commission Society, run by Brit Tony Anthony. We brought over a little over 2,000 tonnes of food. It's been great to the last 200 tonnes mm. to have the RT boxes. Um, and we are only really operating in the east and the south, in the, in the war zone. And only two days ago, we were about 500 metres from the Russians. Um, in actual fact, it was a, uh, we were glad we were stopped by the Ukrainian soldiers who came out with their guns pointing right at us. Um, and because they were wondering, what are you doing here? They were trying to understand, who are we? Um, and when they were sure that we were just missionaries, they said, you're crazy, what are you doing? What should the New Zealand government be doing to help? You know, we put out for the needs of, um, med especially medical now, m maybe an outreach of more uh, food supplies that we can actually buy here in the Ukraine. It makes sense to actually tr invest into the Ukraine instead of, of actually getting these boxes shipped in from other places. It would make sense for us to try and shop locally on, on products they actually want to eat. But the medical needs are, are great here at the moment. There's going to be a great need for even psychologists to come because, I mean, like, sure, we you, can't you've heard the sound of these, these sirens are relentless. Just outside of Kiev, we visit what was once a resort hotel. Now it's a medic HQ, Perigov First Volunteer Mobile Hospital. We have cardiovascular, ACLS, so stuff that we would need on the ambulance and the front line. It's here we meet Jenny Mully, a combat nurse from LA. For Kiwis who might be like, oh, we're on the other side of the world, we can't help, we feel useless, helpless, what do you say to them? makes a difference in your saving lives. I mean, you can sleep better at night knowing that your contribution has saved the life of someone who's a daughter, son, husband, father of a frontline warrior. So please donate and help. Is he bleeding? Yeah, he's bleeding. Drink it and more. It's a small effort when compared to what Jenny does on the battlefield. Here she is operating on an injured soldier by the light of an iPhone. Okay, let me see. Yeah. Is he still bleeding? No, he's not bleeding anymore. Okay. Not bleeding anymore. 
In preparation for the next rotation out, old donated ambulances are stripped back and readied for war conditions. <laughs> Eugene Fadine is a doctor, now volunteer medic, treating those injured wounds caused by artillery, mines, explosions. These are very harmful traumas because it damaged lots of parts of the body as well. There are some damages and injuries from fire, so mostly these are critical issues. So why do you do what you do? Because he can help people and he can save someone's life. Do you get scared? Sometimes. So we do need to catch up. It's medical volunteers like this that Kiwi Tenby Powell is teaming up with. The former Tauranga mayor, businessman and ex-soldier has been evacuating civilians from frontline towns. Look, many people would say, well, what is the point? If you can't bring people out in the thousands, what on earth are you doing bringing people out in ones, twos and fives? It still makes a difference. It makes, you know, in my mind, it makes something of a difference to the war effort because one of Putin's aims is a mass exodus of, of Ukrainian refugees into Western Europe. We've seen that, and that's exactly what he's looking to do. So in some way, it's a, it's a small incremental, you know, war effort, but it's a huge, um, it's a huge event for the families to be reunited. And Tenby wants us to remember the war is already touching us all. It's part of the reason he's come here. We're going to see the effects of it, whether it's fuel prices at New Zealand fuel pumps or food in New Zealand supermarkets, it's going to continue. So I think we, we, we really do need to be involved in some way to help out. And look, you know, personally, you know, I was diagnosed with stage four prostate cancer. At the moment, I'm fit and I'm well um, and, and able to function here really effectively. But I'm only one bl blood test away from, you know, having maybe needing new treatment, I hope not, but so I'm just doing it while I can. The war has a way of repurposing people and places. Closer is the heart of Eastern Europe's underground club scene. The nightclub, made up of old factory spaces, became a factory line during the invasion, making Molotov cocktails and sniper nets. It's still collecting and distributing for refugees. And so you Closer's co-founder, Serhi Bell, is one of the few people in Kiev still going to the bunker when there's an air siren. Three, four minutes we can go down, and this is good option for us. <laughs> the one time they didn't go down, this happened. On a, um, a diplomatic level, our officials have expressed outrage at the war and called for a de-escalation of the conflict, but they haven't taken the strongest step they can. Should New Zealand kick out the Russian ambassador to New Zealand or Russian diplomats that are posted in New Zealand? Well, uh, the New Zealand have joined uh, the sanctions policy and uh, we are uh, grateful to the government of New Zealand for joining this uh, sanctions policy as for the Russian uh, diplomats. Of course, we would be happy if uh, that would be the case, if Russian diplomats would be sent out of uh, their country, because uh, the more it uh, happens around the world, the stronger we are, because it, it's all uh, like uh, steps in uh, further isolation of, of Russian now, this is what would happen uh, with, with you if you are going for, in, to war. I mean, so the people or in the countries would be turning away from you, from your society. So it's all part of the isolation. And this is just like um, an example of further blocking Russia, uh, blocking uh, visas being issued uh, to its citizens of, uh, or considering Russia as a terrorist state or state sponsoring the terrorism. Joe Biden and, and Boris Johnson are among the, the world leaders who have called Vladimir Putin a war criminal. Our Prime Minister has stopped short of calling him a war criminal. Do you think she should call him for what he is? 
Well, I believe that it's, it's her decision to be taking, and uh, uh, really it's important because it, it means a lot for the society, and a lot of uh, societies are considering Russia as a state aggressor, uh, as a terrorist state, and President Putin is considered as the leader of that terrorist state. So it, it's important, but it's, it, it's her decision, it's, it, it's the decision of the government to be taking. Yes. That's when I was going to New Zealand to move. It's also up to the government to decide whether to broaden the Ukraine special visa to extended families. I have a fear of losing them. And um, if something like that happens, I'll never forgive it to myself. Sorry. February the 24th is the day Russia invaded Ukraine. Is this on the front lines? Okay. For Anna Zaychenko, it's also the day her mother died of a heart attack. On the first day my mother mm, passed away. I'm sorry. <laughs> a week later, her grandmother died. Then, in a cruel trifecta of trauma, her brother George was killed on the front line by Russian forces. <sighs> he was the type of guy that you <laughs> meet and I think he's like, you know, the best mate ever. And he has a daughter? Yes, a daughter. Uh, her name is Olga. In Olga Zaychenko's small Kiev apartment, there's a shrine to her father. He'd retired from the military, planned to settle, but when the capital was attacked, he took Olga to safety and re-enlisted. She has not accepted it yet and she cannot accept it and still she has hope that maybe it was an error, a mistake, maybe he will return. When Anna tried to get Olga to New Zealand away from the war, their application for the Ukraine special visa was refused. Disappointing doesn't begin to cut it. Probably devastating more than disappointing. Every time the air raid sirens wail, and that happens a lot, Olga is overcome with panic. She wants to go to New Zealand very much because, uh, first of all, it says that uh, each time, even now, when she uh, hears uh, air alerts. She has anxious attack, like maybe a bit of panic, and she need to take some pills in order in order to beat it and to call it with it. And uh, as well, her father wanted her when the war started. The war, her father wanted her to leave Ukraine to go to safer place, and they always see saw it at the New Zealand. The Ukraine special visa was meant to help 4,000 Ukrainians. So far, just 289 have been accepted and made it to New Zealand. But now that will be disappointing to you. The government has the power to extend the visa. It promised it would consider it, but still nothing, leaving New Zealand-based Ukrainians fearing for their families. I have a fear of losing them. And um, if something like that happens, I'll never forgive it to myself. <laughs> Sorry. I know it's not my fault, the war, and um, I know each of us can do things. So politicians can do, can change laws to serve people. To save lives. And to save lives. Yes, yes. That's when I was going to New Zealand, move. Tanya Zagrabelko's cousin Elena is like a sister to her. A sister left stranded in Ukraine with her son, denied visas. Uh, this war made me hollow. It made such a big... Um, I don't know, I have so much pain and hate and anger and anxiety and all these feelings I never experienced before. If they're not alive and coming them here, then they're leaving them to die. That's true. Leave them, they die there. Bring them here, they'll have their lives here.
And remember, these Ukrainians don't want to leave their homes. War has forced them out. One third of all Ukrainians displaced. Are you grateful for the Ukraine special visa that New Zealand has put in place that helps connect Ukrainians with Kiwi Ukrainians? Well, that's a one step uh, more towards the Ukrainians or in favor of Ukrainians, I would say, because it offers the capabilities, it offers uh, the people with, with the possibility of, of making a choice. And uh, indeed, we, uh, we are grateful to, to New Zealand for making those special visas for, for, for Ukrainians. I, I don't have uh, an information as to how many of Ukrainians have used this uh, uh, special visa possibilities. Uh, uh, with the New Zealand, because uh, most of the people would go to Europe or to Poland, and Poland has hosted millions of Ukrainians. And uh, um, I would say really that it's it's important that, you, that New Zealand has made this a step, and it's much better than those countries who did right the opposite, because uh, some of the countries has imposed a visa regime, uh, even though we didn't have a, a visa. Uh, with them before the war. Mm. A lot of New Zealand-based Ukrainians want that visa extended to extended family because it's too restrictive. It's too restrictive to just close family. Should they extend, should the New Zealand government extend that visa? Well, of course, I would like to say at first that uh, we are very grateful for t taking those steps towards these people or in favor of our, of our people still. I don't think that uh, uh, the, the number of Ukrainians who use this opportunity uh, it did not depend on the, the exact conditions for receiving those visas, but on some other factors. And of course, it's, it's fairly ex expensive uh, to get to, to New Zealand besides the might have um, be lacking the information on how much money they would need to sustain uh, themselves uh, in uh, in New Zealand. So, so it, it's important to have a visa-free regime, but still there's much other issues on the table that uh, uh, are important and the people, maybe they need some more information or they, they're lacking the contacts because uh, it, it's a long way to, to New Zealand and uh, um, th th it's important to have uh, like, like a support and a special approach to them. But uh, this financial issue, and in, including the cost of the aircraft tickets to New Zealand also plays its role. As a Ukrainian-based New Zealander, her brother died fighting in Donbass. He has a niece in Kiev, but because she's her niece, she can't go to New Zealand because it's not for nieces or cousins, it's only for brothers, sisters, mm -hmm. parents. And she is so desperate to help her niece who is terrified and traumatised to get to New Zealand, but she can't. And she'll pay for it. The visa is restrictive. <coughs> Well, uh, of course, I would like to say that uh, it, it's hard for me to, to criticize any of the steps uh, taken by uh, by the foreign governments, and I know that the foreign governments, in some cases, they're um, they're taking the, the, the difficult decisions, and uh, whenever they're taking a decisions as to the visa regime, they're afraid of many of, of, of a possible inflow of, of the com people coming to their country, but I believe they shouldn't be afraid of an inflow of a significant number of Ukrainians uh, to their countries uh, to, uh, because of, as I've said, this financial issues, the financial stability, they, 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 they need of uh, being sure about this. So uh, maybe they shouldn't be that restrictive considering that there is mm, hardly a risk of uh, a significant inflow of Ukrainians coming to New Zealand. From the Ukrainian government to ours, maybe the visas shouldn't be that restrictive. Next, what to do with the Russian diplomats in New Zealand and Zelensky on Putin. What would happen if you were alone in a room, no cameras, with Vladimir Putin?
Seeing the realities of the war is profound. It's why the Ukrainian president is so determined the world's media and world leaders see what's happening on the ground for themselves. Should Jacinda Ardern, our Prime Minister, have come to Ukraine? Indeed, I've, I've extended an official invitation for the Prime Minister of New Zealand to arrive and uh, I, I understand there were some uh, issues uh, preventing her, um, the uh, arrival of the Prime Minister uh, to Ukraine. But at the same time, we had a phone call. Uh, it was an absolutely positive phone call, so we've exchanged a, a lot of uh, issues over the phone and uh, we have received uh, some support both from the private and the public sector I think the support amounts into 20 million dollars uh, uh, and uh, still uh, as we are the country of war we would be always looking for support and uh, welcoming the support that could be provided uh, to Ukraine. Now uh, the, the, the scope of support, the amount of support, it depends on the level of support coming from the society and the society is looking at their own leaders and uh, the Prime Minister of Australia when he came in he, he voiced this support coming from his country and he also said that, the, the, that New Zealand is uh, uh, offering the support to Ukraine and uh, we, we can feel it but it's really important that uh, the, the leaders of those countries would be able to come to Ukraine and see something with their own eyes because that would that would understand that would allow them to have a profound understanding of what the needs of uh, the people of Ukraine are at this hardship times. So she should come, Jacinda Ardern should come to Ukraine? She's very welcome. She's welcome, yes, of course. It was pleasure. And you want her to because you think it's important. I think it's important. I think important, important for us and important for every leader, I think, to understand the masthab, scale. Uh, scale, scale, to understand the scale of, of the war. So the invitation, just to be clear, the invitation is still open to yes, Jacinda of course, Ardern? of course. And she's indicated that she might come, maybe later? Yes, I think I think I, I think I think she said yes. She will. She will when when she 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 will we'll, find possibilities. She will. We'll keep asking her for you. Thank you so much. From the moment we arrive in Ukraine, seeing the queue of trucks struggling to leave the country with supplies, to the moment we leave, passing the same 22-kilometre-long queue back to the border with Poland, we've been confronted by the different stages of war. But you don't have to peel things back far to see the hurt. My father in uh, going to Mariupol. Uh, he is died in a Russian attack. Yeah. War. Russian terrorist. It's fucking. <laughs> the fucking crazy shit. Mikolaev, already pockmarked with missile craters. Just try to imagine this kind of life. Shooting all the time, and sometimes windows are crashed, sometimes you can find a dead body just near the building in the central city. Uh, old people suffering much because they do not have resources. Uh, the life is horrible in comparison to what we had before the war. They shell us each day. Each day you do not know if you will wake up. Only in the morning you wake up and you see if you are alive or not. And yet he will not leave his home. I won't leave my home. I was born here and I want to live here and I want to survive everything that is a meeting for me but I want to stay at my home. When you say goodbye to people here, it feels very final. Danke uh, schön. Jukuyu. I love you. <laughs> Leaving Mikolaev too feels significant. Russia is determined to take this strategic town. But first, Russia and its president, Vladimir Putin, must face off against the unflinching resolve of the Ukrainian people and their president. When you think about what happened in Butcher, what happened more broadly in the war, the needless loss of life, women, men raped, tortured, executed, what would happen if you were alone in a room, no cameras, with Vladimir Putin? 
Ну, я б точно використав би цю ситуацію. I would use this situation. You would use Definitely. it. Use it how? Як? Не зовсім готові сказати. Може, у мене буде така... Well, uh, I, I, I don't think I'm ready to tell you how, uh, but uh, hopefully I would have this situation somewhere in the future. And if that would be the case, I'm not willing to prepare the other side for... Or what would be my response to that? I'm reading between the lines. Я читаю між строк. Зрозуміло, пане президенте. Дякую. Thank you.